Hello and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we go back to May 1983 to get the latest news and top selling games, we bang the rocks together to find the best Spectrum Asteroids clone, we check out some early Quicksilver games, and take a look at some newer titles. But first, back to the time machine and May 1983. DKtronics has secured a deal with the record company KTEL to provide wider distribution of its games through record shops and wholesalers. The aim is to get five games per month promoted by this route and the deal is said to be the largest single order for the UK home computer market. Quicksilver founders John Hollis and Nick Lambert are to step down from the day-to-day -day running of the software company, allowing Rod Cousins to become general manager. The company expect an annual turnover this year of £10 million. Both men say they intend to continue providing ideas and games, despite rumours of a new company. Softech and Silversoft are in dispute over a game. Slippery Sid, sold by Silversoft, was written using the Super C compiler, sold by Softech and as such, argue Softec, they are entitled to royalty payments. Softec say that the compiler's instructions state it cannot be used for commercial games, and because its libraries are used as part of the final game, royalties must now be paid for every copy of Slippery Sid sold. Silversoft state the compiler was purchased mail order, and that there was no mention of royalties in the advert, and therefore any claim is invalid. They further say that they are happy to fight as far as Softec want to take it. Argus Press launched what they claim to be the first computer magazine on cassette. Called Spectrum Computing, it's obviously aimed at Spectrum users and will be compatible with both 16 and 48k machines. The magazine will include reviews and software and will be available from WH Smith and John Menzies priced at $2.99. Scion and Sinclair are jointly working on a new ROM system for the Spectrum that will see games loaded via cartridge rather than tape. An interface will be required and Sinclair expect it to be sold for around £20. Scion claim to be preparing six titles for the launch along with the interface and hope it will stem piracy, which they claim is taking nearly £3 million from the company each year. And now on to the top selling games. The Hobbit and Penetrator are still hogging the charts as they have done for the last couple of months. So the new titles coming in are the vampire hunting horror 3D Mazathon called Transylvania Tower from Richard Shepard Software. You can take to the skies with Scion's Flight Simulator. Horace makes a welcome return in Horace Goes Skiing. Workforce presents us with their Monopoly game Do Not Pass Go. And finally, DKtronics gave us their space 3D shoot 'em up Spawn of Evil. Asteroids made a break from traditional raster-based games and introduced the gameplay and public to the wonderful new neon-like style of vectors. Released in 1979, the game also gave the player freedom to traverse the screen in any direction. Because the arcade machines required special hardware to produce the new style of graphics, home versions struggled to replicate the display. Instead, the games companies used different techniques to either emulate the rasters or use sprites instead. So, which of the Spectrum clones can claim to be top dog? First up we have Cosmic Debris from Arctic Computing, released in 1983. This version of the classic looks very authentic, having vector-like graphics and all the game elements of the original. The asteroids move around as they should, splitting into smaller chunks when hit, and the saucers make random appearances. The thrust has an odd effect though, in that the ship does not move and then slow down to a stop like the arcade, but instead it continues until a thrust in the opposite direction is done. This makes control slightly tricky. The sound is adequate, but the real bad point about this game is the explosion when your ship gets hit. The screen is filled with diagonal lines, and although it looks spectacular, it, it soon gets dull and you just find yourself wanting to get back to some arcade action. The sound played in between lives also gets annoying, and there's no need for it at all. The last thing to mention is the lack of any on-screen information. There's no high score, no scoring and no lies. 
this makes it slightly tricky if you're trying to beat your high score when you actually can't see what it is. Next up is Meteor Storm from Quicksilver, released in 1982. This entry into the asteroids market is one of, if not the first, commercial Spectrum game to include speech. A scratchy voice calls out when the game begins, but the exact words have been debated many times. My opinion is that the game shouts scramble, scramble, but no doubt you'll have your own ideas. The asteroids move around less smoothly than cosmic debris, seemingly in character based jumps. Despite this though, the game does play quite well. The random saucers are there, but in a different colour which helps to locate them on a busy screen. The rotation of the player's ship is fixed at 8 compass points, which means firing is also fixed to these same points. This detracts slightly, but the game pace is well suited to these limitations. When thrust is applied, the ship moves until reverse thrust is applied, again unlike the arcade game. This makes things difficult and often causes your ship to career into asteroids as you stab wildly at the thrust key. The sound is simple, with the firing sound and saucer sounds, but it could have been better. Overall this is a competent version that plays well and has all the elements of the arcade. Next we have Meteoroids from Soft Deck, released in 1982. If I didn't know any better I would have said that this version was compiled basic judging by almost every aspect of the game. The only thing that looks, or should I say sounds machine code, is the sound. And even that uses the same routine used in a vast majority of early games and was even available as a small typing in many magazines. The game uses large graphics and I deliberately did not use the word sprites there. The large character based images jerk around the screen following predictable paths through space. Thrusting causes your ship to move forward and then stop there's no inertia. This makes control easier, but varies from the arcade game. The sound, apart from the game start and end siren, consists of a simple tick-tick when firing, and also you get a sound when a saucer appears. The player's ship is fixed at eight positions again, which doesn't help this already poor game. Another game called Meteoroids, this time released by DK Tronics in 1982. This is a very early Don Priestley game and just shows how much his talent grew within 12 months. But it is difficult to see how this game came from the same person who released 3D tanks and Maziacs in the same year. The juddery graphics move in character based leaps and the player's ship is again fixed at 8 points. The game stops to play sound effects and there is a huge problem in the overall gameplay. If you hit an asteroid within 8 pixels of your ship, smaller fragments are generated. Unfortunately, this often means that one is generated right over the top of your ship, which destroys you instantly. The thrust does mimic the arcade in that you move and then slowly come to a halt, but because it's in character based jumps it looks terrible. Another bad point is that after each life is lost, the game flips back to a holding screen and beeps until you press a key to continue. This really is one to stay away from. Next up is Planetoids, released by Sinclair and Scion in 1982. Although this version of the game is not authentic in that the graphics are filled, it does play rather well and has that all important just one more go factor. The graphics are very smooth and control is responsive, making for a good playing experience. The sound could have been better with just a tick tick when firing and a bleep sound when you hit a saucer or another object hits your ship. The most annoying thing about the whole game is the constant siren on the intro page. The playing screen does not display remaining lives either, which really should be there. One major factor is the rotation which is an improvement over every other game apart from Cosmic Debris. In this game the ship has 16 angles, which makes the rotation smoother and the game much more playable. The thrust also works like the arcade, although there is less inertia, but even so this makes the game much more playable. This is considered by many to be the best asteroid clone for the Spectrum, but there is still a lot of room for improvement. Lastly we have Spectroid Storm, released by Abasoft in 1983. I don't really know where to start with this dreadful game. Considering it was released in 1983, it should be at least like the arcade machine. Instead we get a white background with multicoloured asteroids and strange shaped alien ships. 
the graphics are character based and the standard 8 position rotation is used, but with all that colour and white background it, it really does irritate. The score flashes constantly, which causes a distraction, and at times there's just too much going on on screen. Using the thrust is madness, your ship hurtles around the screen, sometimes seemingly invincible, but all the time totally uncontrollable. This is a very disappointing game considering the year of release. And the winner of this episode's arcade shootout is... As you probably guessed, Planetoids from Sinclair and Scion. Despite coming out the winner though, this game is far from perfect. I still think there is not a single good Asteroids clone on the Spectrum, which is a real shame. Maybe it didn't have the raw power to deal with vectors, but I'm sure it had the capability to improve on the mediocre games that exist. So for now, if you fancy breaking some rocks, I suggest grabbing a copy of MAME. By the way, I deliberately left out Blasteroids, simply because it was an arcade game on its own, and came much later. Although the Spectrum version is quite good. Now in this section we look back at two early Quicksilver games, starting with Astro Blaster. The original arcade game was released by Sega in 1981 and is a typical shoot 'em up featuring different attack waves, asteroids and motherships. It also had the added complexity of having to monitor fuel and temperature. Unfortunately, the Spectrum version doesn't have these features. There are waves of aliens that fly horizontally across the screen, occasionally dropping bombs. The amount of bombs increased with the levels. Because of the screen layout, the room between your ship and the aliens is much smaller than the arcade, making it more difficult to play. Once you get past the first two waves, the next obstacle is an asteroid stone. Red asteroids rain down, some of which can be shot, others can't. This mimics the arcade version, although in the arcade version you do get the option of picking up extra fuel. After this you get a large circling blob dropping bombs. This is very difficult to destroy unless you know where it's going to appear and you can flood the screen with shots. Again, this differs from the arcade version. Usually at this point you are asked to dock with the mothership, but this is completely missed out of the Spectrum version. Once you get through a couple of waves of aliens and different sprites, you go through a couple of asteroid fields and past a few of those round blobs, the game starts again back with the original aliens. I wouldn't say it's a classic game, nor would I say it's a brilliant game. But there's something about this game that I like and I enjoy playing it. I know it hasn't got brilliant graphics and brilliant sound, but hey, that's just me. Next we have Frenzy, released in 1982. Frenzy is based on the arcade game Berserk, released by Stern in 1980, and takes its name from the follow-up released in 1984. The story goes something like this, a lone fighter pilot has returned to a refueling station to find it overrun by monstrous robots and has to fight his way to the control room to call for help. The game looks fairly basic, but it is similar to its arcade counterpart. The red walls, which are deadly to touch, form a basic maze with entrances on each side. Each room has a number of robots lumbering about which you have to destroy to move on to the next level. You can move rooms without destroying all of the robots, but this doesn't take you forward in levels, or towards the end of the game, if in fact there is one. If you spend too long in a single room, a large white ball, known as Evil Otto in the arcade game, bounces in that cannot be destroyed, and promptly heads straight towards you. This encourages you to keep moving. If you do manage to destroy all of the robots, then you move up a level, and the game becomes more difficult. This is achieved by the robots firing back, smaller robots laying mines, and fast-moving cluster robots which can't be destroyed. Despite looking very simple in design, once you master the controls it soon becomes challenging and fun. The later levels for me were quite difficult, especially when most of the on-screen items could not be destroyed, and are deadly to the player. You often found yourself just moving between rooms in the hope that you could find a less crowded area. It's not a bad game really, but certainly not a classic. Released in 2011 by Timmy, Future Looter definitely has its roots in the classic Spectrum game Cybernoid. Controlling a large spaceship, 
you have to fly through several levels, blasting the nasties, navigating the rooms and locating crystals. This is not a fast paced shooter though, despite its gorgeous looks. The game is much more of a puzzler than a shooter. After the intro screen with some great music from Mr. Beep, the game begins and you soon discover that moving from room to room involves a bit of brain power. Some puzzles are simple enough in that you learn the patterns of the enemies, slot in behind them and wait until you can get to the exit. Further into the game and things become a little more tricky though. Blocks have to be destroyed to let the floating nasty continue on its path. Shoot out the correct blocks and the nasty will eventually create a path for you to move on. There are still aliens to shoot, but don't be too hasty, you may need them to break through to the next room. The game is colourful, smooth and has some great looking graphics. The sound is good and difficulty is just about right. It's a shame it's a little short though, with only three levels that keep repeating. This is still a great game and well worth downloading. That's the end of this episode, I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help make in the next one, get in touch via the details below. See you soon!